Welcome back to the Catholic Retrospective Podcast. This is Father Peter Mangum. I'm so grateful to you all, Catholic and Protestant alike, coming together and learning and praying for the restoration of unity among all Christians. This is Episode 7, The Catholic Reformation and the Council of Trent. While Protestants might say that the Reformation of the Church began with Martin Luther's famous act of October 31st, 1517, We Catholics believe that the Reformation of the Church occurred through a series of council meetings at Trent in northern Italy, beginning in the year 1545. For 18 years, over the course of many sessions convened by three successive popes, the bishops of the Church, Catholic and Apostolic, gathered at the Council of Trent to consider the protests registered by Luther and others. The council deliberated and reached consensus on reforms of practice that were necessary in the church and then put forward 17 dogmatic constitutions or decrees that affirmed the historical position on many Catholic doctrines challenged by Protestants. For us, this is the Reformation, the Catholic Reformation, sometimes called the Counter-Reformation. Well, that frames our podcast today. Some of my non-Catholic friends may not like what I'm about to say, but it helps you understand our perspective. We believe that bringing about reform in the church requires being fully in communion with the church and her doctrines and sacraments. So for those who left the communion of the church, to use the term Reformation to describe the events of the resulting 16th century divisions is not accurate because we understand our authority to rest with the successors of the apostles, our bishops, with a special teaching authority vested in the Bishop of Rome by the primacy of St. Peter, the first among equals. We know that any true reform must flow from and through that authority, through the great magisterial workings of the one body of Christ. Pope Paul III called the Council of Trent which met in its first session between 1545 and 1549. The second session convened the following year in 1551 under Pope Julius III and the final session of 1562 by Pope Pius IV. The primary objectives were clear from the outset. Firstly, to clarify the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church on all points disputed by Protestants. And secondly, to bring about a reform of discipline and administration within the church. The corrupt practices highlighted by Protestants had to be addressed. At its conclusion, the Council reaffirmed Catholic teaching on key doctrinal points, including the equality of sacred scripture and sacred tradition in informing the church, that the church is indeed the final interpreter of sacred scripture, and a redefinition of the proper relationship between faith and works in the plan of salvation. Just as importantly, please listen up, the very abuses to which the Protestant movement had brought attention, such as the sale of indulgences and the sale of church offices, were directly addressed with new and stricter disciplinary measures. The Council of Trent issued a total of 17 dogmatic constitutions, which are documents that represent binding truth. These cover many teachings challenged by the Protestant movement and represent a reaffirmation of the Catholic position on such things as the canonical scriptures, the seven sacraments, the doctrine of purgatory, the veneration of saints and relics, etc. Interestingly, The Council of Trent also responded to the assault on many religious artworks that had occurred throughout the Protestant Europe, including the near destruction of the famous Ghent altarpiece by a riot in that Flemish city, a masterpiece I stood before just a month ago, and that I have used in our classes regarding the Catholic retrospective. Trent affirmed that proper religious artwork does indeed glorify God and therefore should always have a place within our churches. Our beautiful stained glass, statues, sculptures, paintings, as well as the art form of sacred music continue to attest to our ongoing Catholic embrace of art, as well as a mysterious way of encountering the divine, the way of beauty. 
You might recall that back in episode three, I posed the question of whether it is possible for the church to be in grave error, and I made the point of distinguishing between doctrine, a teaching of the church acting on apostolic foundation and therefore cannot be in error, and practice, subject to the corruption of the human condition. It's important to note this, and again, please listen up here too. Not one doctrine or dogma changed as a result of all the protests. Indeed, the Council of Trent answered each doctrinal objection with the weighted authority of sacred scripture and sacred tradition, drawing heavily from the beliefs of the earliest church to the fathers and doctors of the church. While reaffirming these doctrines of the church, the Council of Trent did not hesitate to reform abuses of practice. Some have suggested that these dogmatic decrees of the Council of Trent only deepened the divide between Catholics and Protestants because the Council made no concessions to Protestant ideas. But the Catholic Church cannot concede or give in in any way to that which is not the truth. And by defending the truth, the Council, in fact, could not yield to new individual interpretations of Holy Scripture or to growing variations produced by many different Protestant groups of then and now. Given our deep desire for unity, for which we have prayed and continue to do so, it is perhaps a fair question, what can Protestants and Catholics learn from each other? This, in fact, is a question received from several of you who offered feedback. Well, it is our hope that Protestants will use this historic opportunity to learn as much as possible about the actual history of the one universal church founded by Christ on apostolic succession and to ultimately come to understand that the one church is the repository of all truth. We grieve for their loss of this perspective. We pray that we will yet again share communion. Now, as Catholics, we recognize that the protests registered by the voices of the 16th century, including Martin Luther, brought much-needed attention to abuses of practice that demanded reform. We appreciate the reorientation of the Catholic view to see again the greatness of God's merciful grace and the prominence of faith in our understanding of salvation, much of which is eloquently expressed by Protestant thinkers. Peter Kreeft just this year published through Ignatius Press a matter-of-fact without all the academic lingo book entitled Catholics and Protestants, What We Can Learn from Each Other to bring Protestants and Catholics into closer union. I highly recommend it. Pope John XXIII, when convening the Second Vatican Council in 1962, said of the Council of Trent that what was still is. Vatican II documents address Protestants as our separated brethren and emphasize a strong call to unity In a decree on ecumenism called Unitatis Redenti Gratio, the Second Vatican Council stated very clearly, quote, We believe that our Lord entrusted all of the blessings of the new covenant to the apostolic college alone, of which St. Peter is the head, in order to establish the one body of Christ on earth to which all should be fully incorporated. Unity has been the tireless call of the church since the tragic divisions began five centuries ago. Recently, Pope Francis asked God's mercy upon the divisions of Christianity and said, We cannot erase what happened, but we do not want to allow the burden of past faults to continue to poison our relationships. He also recently tweeted, yes, via his Twitter account, he said, Forgiveness sets our hearts free and allows us to start anew. Forgiveness gives hope. Without forgiveness, the church is not built up. There is but one Lord, Jesus Christ. There is therefore but one body of Christ. Next week, join me for an exploration of the lives of some of the saints of this historic era, the true reformers of the church. Until then, we ask for God's guidance for unity among all who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I cannot fail to repeat the fact that the Catholic Church offers Masses our highest prayer for the unity of all Christians 
as it was founded when Christ founded his church upon the rock-solid foundation of Peter's confession of faith. So, to conclude this podcast, let me use yet another of the prayers particularly apropos given our topic today. It's the Collect, the opening prayer of the Mass for Unity of Christians found in the Roman Missal's collection of texts. We can now pray that prayer together. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Until next week, thanks for listening to the Catholic Retrospective Podcast. <laughs>